You're listening to Little Green Cheese, Season 2, Episode 3. Well, welcome back. I'm Gavin Webber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. We've got a fairly full show today. We're going to be talking about raw milk cheese, and that's the main topic we have today. Now, those who uh, make cheese here in Australia, you may know that there has been some regulations changed that allow cheesemakers or commercial cheesemakers to make raw milk cheese. Now, there were some there, there was a clause within the Australian food standard that did say that you could make raw milk cheeses. However, they had to be cheeses that were cooked to a high temperature. So that was like Parmesan and Romano. And they were the basic ones that they could make here in Australia. And there's only actually two dairies within Australia that can make, uh, that are making uh, raw milk cheese. Now, I dare say this will probably change a fair bit uh, now that they are going to allow raw milk cheese to be made over a wider range of of cheeses. Anyway, what I've found is I found a clip, and this is from um, ABC Radio Rural, and it talks about how the regulations are going to affect commercial cheesemakers. Now, I know we're not commercial cheesemakers, um, but... Really, you do need to appreciate some of the process that the commercial cheesemakers go through so that we as home cheesemakers can make a better product. Now, the interview I'm going to play, this is uh, between the radio host on um, ABC Rural. Uh, who is the host? It's uh, Tony Briscoe talking to a guy called Tom Ross. Now, he's an associate professor at the Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture and he's going to be discussing some of the changes to raw milk milk cheese regulations. Very interesting. I found it interesting anyway, so I hope you'll enjoy that. So here it is here. There was a perceived inconsistency in some of the the regulations that related to imported cheeses, and Australian cheesemakers wanted to be able to produce similar kinds of cheeses. So what we've got are regulations now that sort of emulate some of the, the processes, guidelines, regulations that apply in other parts of the world where raw cheese is a little bit more common. Just to put it in perspective, how many cheese makers in Australia now make cheese from raw milk? Because it has been banned pretty much locally, there's a Two that I know of, one in uh, South Australia and one in Tasmania, of course. Tom, what's your involvement in the raw milk issue? I'm a food microbiologist, so we keep an eye on those sorts of things as well. But I've been involved in doing a, a project for the New Zealand Ministry of Primary Industries, as well as Victorian Department of Health also had an interest in the issue um, from a perspective of protecting public health, but um, without hindering uh, primary industries too much. They're coming up with a sensible set of regulations that do protect the public. And what has your research indicated about the safety factors in making cheese from raw milk? If we think about the regulations, because it's probably a good place to start, what they're saying is that if we've got a product that doesn't support the growth of those bacteria that can make you sick, as long as you start with very good quality milk, that is milk that doesn't have any of those bad bacteria in them, or very, 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 very few, um, and that the process doesn't allow growth of the bacteria, um, and that if there is a little bit of growth, then that's countered by the bacteria dying off in the cheese during the period of ripening or maturation, then that should be the, the basis for being able to produce a cheese made from raw milk. Now, over the last couple of years, I believe your laboratory at UTAS has been devoted to a fair bit of cheese making. Yeah, we produced, I think, five or six different kinds of cheese. We made them with raw milk um, and with the same milk that, that we pasteurised here as well. Um, and just looked at the differences in the the behaviour of the bacteria in those um, different cheese products. We tried to emulate commercial practice as closely as we could, so we had the assistance of a couple of cheesemakers, one looking over our shoulders the first time we tried it, but getting regular advice from them, and others who were doing it sort of from a hobby. So the cheeses were, for all intents and purposes, the same sorts of cheeses that people might like to make and buy. Um, What we did was put those bad bacteria into them and watched what happened over time. So we did a lot more tests along the way um, on those cheeses that we made. Tom, why do cheesemakers want to use raw milk? There's a 
general perception, and I guess a couple of the, the cheesemakers I've spoken to here make the point that you get a, a more diverse set of flavours and, and tastes and aromas from cheese made from raw milk, and partly that's due to the um, presence of other bacteria that you don't put in um, as part of the cheese making process, but that are present naturally in the milk itself. If you pasteurise the milk, those bacteria get killed, and so their contribution is to some extent nullified. Um, at the same time, in any cheese making process, we add other kinds of bacteria, typically called lactic acid bacteria, the ones that we use to make cheese. And so they also make contributions to flavours and so on. And, so, and, and there are other kinds of bacteria and moulds that are added for specific kinds of cheese too that also have a, a particular role in the texture and the flavour development. What sort of cheeses are we talking about that can be made from raw milk? Any, any sort of cheese? Not any sort. Um, if you look at the regulations, and there's a good reason for this, um, they'll pretty much eliminate soft cheeses. So it'll be sort of more firm cheeses like Goudas, Edams, Cheddars and so on, um, because they're the ones that do not allow the growth of those pathogenic bacteria once they've been uh, matured or whilst they're maturing as well. With the soft cheeses like Brie's and Camembert, um, over time, the pH, the, the acidity, if you like, in the cheese is reduced. And as that uh, acidity drops down again, it allows pathogenic bacteria to start to grow. So in a Gouda or an Edam or a Cheddar, they're suppressed from growing and in fact die slowly over time. In a Brie or a Camembert, when that ripening process starts, when it starts to go soft in the middle, that allows, if there are any those bad bacteria there, that allows them the opportunity to start to grow again and that's why they're inherently less safe. Do you expect that there'll be a flood of raw milk cheeses coming onto the market over the next few years following this decision? Um, I couldn't really say, but I would imagine given the level of interest from cheesemakers that there'd certainly be quite a few that'll give it a go. Um, and there are good reasons why they would want to do that. The, the connoisseurs might well prefer it, but it won't be a cheap process because of all these extra regulations that relate to farm practice, so animal husbandry practice, the actual process of milking, milk transport, things you have to do um, before you even start to make that cheese. So again, pasteurisation covers a lot of woes along the way. If you can't, if pasteurisation isn't in place, you have to do lots and lots of other things to ensure the overall safety of the milk that's going into the process before you start. So what would your basic message be to a cheesemaker out there thinking about using raw milk? I think whatever happens, there's going to be a lot of regulatory oversight. So probably one of the first things is think it through, read the, the new Fizan's guidelines. It provides a lot of sort of practical information as well. And then go and talk to the regulator. So in Tasmania, that's Tasmania Dairy Industry Authority. They're the guys who know about this stuff and they're on top of it now. And what about consumers out there thinking about purchasing raw milk cheese? Um, as long as it's made according to these new guidelines and regulations, it should be safe. There's, as I said, there's a lot of effort that will be required. It won't be an easy process to make a raw milk cheese, but neither is that the case in other parts of the world where they have similar levels of regulation and government oversight. And again, it's all about public health. But if it's produced under a, a certified program and there'll be a lot of as I said oversight and um, assurance that everything's being done according to the, the plan and the, the guidelines, it should be safe. Well, that was a very interesting interview. So it's not going to be cheap for producers or cheese producers, commercial cheese producers, to make raw milk cheese here in Australia. There are going to be more uh, and stricter regulations on that type of cheese making than there are if they were making cheese with pasteurised milk. So for those who are jumping up and down, very excited at the moment, you probably will find that if you are here in Australia and you are going to be uh, buying raw milk cheese, the cost will be more expensive at the uh, at the end point, the cheesemonger or the, uh, well, if they ever package it into supermarkets, I'll be surprised, but there will be a cost associated with the consumer buying raw milk cheese. Having said that, I have made a raw milk cheese uh, myself and I made a Romano and it was absolutely delicious. I followed the process to the letter, made sure that it matured at the right temperature and made sure that it matured for the right length of time. And as um, Professor Tom Ross mentioned that as those sorts of cheeses, the harder cheeses, mature, the lactic bacteria increase and uh, that's how the flavour increases in the cheese and it kills off any bad bacteria. 
So, uh, yep, no problems at all with uh, my raw milk. It was very, very nice. Um, I certainly just substituted the uh, normal pasteurized milk that I would use with raw milk, and I didn't add any calcium chloride um, at the start because it set a firm enough curd because, well, it had nothing removed from it and it hadn't heated up and uh, tortured the calcium within the milk. So that's raw milk cheese here in Australia. That's uh, good news uh, for cheese connoisseurs. For home cheese makers, the regulations are set there for a reason for com- commercial. What you do in your own kitchen is your business. Uh, if you want to make raw milk cheese, um, soft cheeses, then go for it. But just be aware that there is so there is risks involved with um, the bad bacteria growing in, in those cheeses because there is no mechanism um, in the cheese maturation process that will kill those off unless you make hard cheeses. And uh, you've got to know where your source of milk comes from. So your source of milk, if it's from your own goat or your own cow and you maintain it and you keep it nice and clean, then uh, it's your responsibility to make sure the cheese is edible for yourself and for your friends and your family. That's all I'll say about raw milk and raw milk cheese at this stage. Well, I've got some news on the uh, cheese shop front. I have been working very hard, and I did did mention that I was going to release a podcast episode a week after the last one, where I talked about uh, seven seven things you may not know about cheese. I got bogged down, (laughs) and I'm terribly sorry. I uh, decided to remaster some of my videos and to record some new stuff, and put them on the very first volume of a DVD that I've released for Australians in the uh, in the PAL format. So it's titled Keep Calm and Make Cheese DVD Volume 1, and this is the Begin- Beginner's Collection. So on this DVD, and I'm going to put a link to it into my show notes, I've got a an introduction on how to prepare your cheese making area, how to use a double boiler, and what sort of equipment you'll need for your cheese making session. Then I uh, go on to include a quick mozzarella, uh, cream cheese, feta, and whey ricotta. So they're the four cheeses that are on that DVD, um, as well as some instructions on how to prep your area, as I just mentioned. So I retail that now for $15 Australian, which I think is quite reasonable. And it has been selling quite well, to my surprise. Not that I didn't have, I didn't have faith in the in the DVD that I create because I get a lot of feedback from the YouTube videos that I create. And I thought, well, let's take the next logical step. Not everybody's got fast broadband. Not everybody's got the time to sit down there and use YouTube and figure it out. And a lot of my audience are of the older generation, and uh, they know how to stick a DVD into a DVD player but they don't know how to use YouTube. So I created this DVD, and this is, as I mentioned, Volume 1. So Volume 2 is going to be Intermediate Collection, and Volume 3 will be the um, the Advanced Collection. So the Advanced ones will have things like Camembert, Blue Cheeses, and, uh, and Parmesan is a little bit more difficult. You've got to get it just right. So there'll be a few of those, and the Intermediate ones will be things like Farmhouse Cheddar, uh, Caffili, uh, Wensleydale and cheeses like that. So I'll put the link into the show notes, as I mentioned. So that was the first thing I worked on. And then uh, I got excited and I decided to import a whole bunch of external cheese fridge thermostats. And these are the very one that I use. And I made a cheese making um, cheese fridge video and showed people how I had it all connected up. But the one thing I'd forgotten to add in to that cheese making video was how to set the bugger up. Um, It's quite easy once you know how, but uh, I've had a lot of emails from frustrated people who have gone out and bought it um, from from Asia um, or from wherever they've got it from and they haven't been able to set it up. So what I've done, I've recorded another cheese making video tutorial that's only available on uh, Little Green Workshops and um, I've got that in the product page, the, the video on how to set it up. Very simple to do. 
Um, so I thought that'll make a, a a good helping video for that product. So it's uh, the external cheese fridge thermostat. And I've got, as I speak at the moment, 11 in stock. <laughs> so there, they'll put the link to the, uh, that product into the show notes as well. So they're the, th the few things that I've been working on as well as maintaining um, the, the, the store and um, I haven't been making a lot of cheese because it's still very, very hot here. As I speak, outside temperature is 34 degrees Celsius, a little bit too warm to make cheese because I wouldn't be able to keep the, uh, the milk cool enough. Inside, it's a balmy 27. However, if I was to make cheese right now and, you know, in, during the last few weeks anyway, uh, of this summer, then the uh, if I was air drying the cheese at, at the end of the pressing process, the cheese would start to sweat and it would sweat oil instead of uh, at a nice room temperature of about 21 degrees Celsius or a bit lower. Um, that's the ideal air drying temperature. So uh, I wouldn't, I would have had an inferior product. So I'm going to wait, I'm going to keep my powder dry and I'm going to wait until autumn which is in a few weeks time but the temperature won't drop until late march here in the southern hemisphere uh, so that's when i'll pick up and start making cheese again so fingers crossed then i'll get some more cheese making videos out there i've got a few in mind I've done uh, some research to find some new recipes uh, online and in some old books that i found as well and uh, I'm going to create cheese making videos for those. So that's the uh, the news that I've got. Um, worked on two products over the last fortnight, and I've got those up on littlegreenworkshops.com.au. But as I said, I'll put the put the product links into the show notes. Now I've got one voicemail and uh, quite a few emails questions, so I'll get stuck into those now. Now, the first one is from Amrith, and we heard him uh, in the last show, I think, or could have been the show before that, and he's from Dublin in South Africa. Take it away, Amrith. Hi, Gavin. It's Amrith speaking in uh, Dublin, South Africa again. Thank you very much for replying to my email on the uh, dosage of the uh, rennet. Uh, it worked out wonderfully. So I made my first halloumi cheese. Just one small mistake I made was that I pressed it uh, too heavy weight. Instead of four kilos, I used six. Anyway, the halloumi came out really well. It's just a little bit hard, but the taste is fantastic. Thank you so much for putting out your recipes and taking the time to do the videos. I really appreciate it. Uh, one question is, uh, today I'm embarking on making mozzarella. I was hoping uh, you have a video on the traditional method of making mozzarella as compared to using the microwave I'm a little bit averse to using microwave I don't like it actually uh, do you have a video that we could use or, or look at uh, making the um, traditional mozzarella uh, please thank you very much bye well thanks Amrith um, no I don't unfortunately <laughs> that's not the kind of answer you want to a question however um, that is one of the cheeses I do have slated for the next batch of cheese making videos and I will be making a traditional mozzarella and I'll be filming that for everybody to see. Now, personally, I've never made traditional mozzarella. I've only made the quick mozzarella where you use the microwave. So it should be interesting. If it doesn't work out the first time, I'll figure out why not and then I'll video the next one. Um, but a thank you very much for your question, Amrith. Um, I will endeavour to make that traditional mozzarella video. And hopefully I uh, won't burn myself because it is a very hot process. <laughs> you have to heat the way up to very high temperatures, just under boiling of the, of the whey and the curds within the whey and to get it runny and and to, uh, to get the, the mozzarella to stretch. So thanks very much for your question. Now, the next one is from Dominic, and Dominic doesn't say, oh, he's from uh, Laval in Quebec, Canada. Um, hi, Gavin. I am a very beginner cheesemaker. In fact, so far, I've made some ricotta, mozzarella, boccaccini that we have immediately consumed. I've also made one wheel of cacci... cacciatore. 
I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, uh, wheel which is aging in the wine cooler fridge. I just wanted to tell you that I saw some of your videos and wanted to thank you for sharing your passion for cheese making. Uh, Dominic from Canada. Well, thanks very much, Dominic. I hope you've caught up with some of those other videos and have tried some more cheese making. Um, it's very addictive, that's for sure. So the next question is from Gail. Now, Gail doesn't say where she's from. She's somewhere in Australia by looking at her email address. Gail goes to say, Hi, Gavin. I have tried twice to make camembert. And the first time I used Woolworths full cream milk, but the two cheeses started out half filling the cheese moulds. But by the time the next morning came, they measured half inch in thickness. I persevered and they grew mould. I now have them wrapped in my fridge, awaiting maturity. On Friday, I bought some Paul's organic unhomogenized milk and followed the instructions again. This time they are less than half an inch and I had a little more than a litre a litre of whey, which I thought I would make into ricotta and finished up with one dessert spoon. Can you please suggest what I'm doing wrong? Kind regards, Gail. Now, Gail, I think this is, this is a tricky one because camembert is an advanced cheese to make. And if it's the first cheese you've ever made, don't get discouraged. Now, what I think may be going on is that even though you've bought normal full cream milk and you've tried organic milk, both of those milks are pasteurised. So you will need to add a, a bit of calcium chloride. Now, the recipes that I have specify how much calcium chloride. Usually it's about half a teaspoon for eight litres of milk. And what that will do is add more soluble calcium to the milk and you'll get a better curd set. And that's what it sounds like is happening. You're not getting the curd setting correctly. And um, by the time your camemberts drain away, they're only about 1.5 centimetres high. Now, normally when I make camembert uh, in the uh, the moulds that I use, they're about, I would say they're about 8 centimetres high, um, the moulds themselves. And you get, uh, out of eight litres of milk, I get four full camemberts out of that. And they're usually about an inch thick, um, not much more than that, because once they all compress down under their own weight, a lot of whey does expel out of those cheeses. Um, and, uh, and that's what you can sort of expect when you use calcium chloride in those two pasteurised milks. So that's what I think the issue may be. Um, not having sent any photos or anything like that, I can't really tell otherwise. But if you are adding calcium chloride, then I'm not sure what issue um, has caused this to happen. Anyway, thanks very much, Gail, for your email. hope that helped a little bit. And uh, yeah, don't forget to pop over and listen to the next episode. But the next question is from... Uh, Julie, and Julie says, Hi, I've been following your videos, but I'm unsure how you use the double boiler or not. Could you send me a picture of what I should be doing to heat the milk, please? Regards, Julie. Now, Julie, this is quite simple. All I do is I get a, a small pot and I put my two-gallon uh, stock pot on top of that. Now, inside of the the smaller pot, I put about... An inch of water, maybe two, uh, just out of the tap. And when that comes to the boil, it creates steam and the steam heats the bottom of the bigger pot that's sitting on top. Um, just make sure you've got a large enough pot on the bottom so that the big one at the top doesn't um, overbalance and you've got milk all over the place. Now, another safer way to do this if you um, don't want to balance uh, a larger pot on a smaller one is to use your kitchen sink. And if you've got a decent hot water that heats up over uh, about 50 degrees Celsius, all you do is you put the plug into your sink, you put the stock pot with the milk in it into the sink as well, um, and then you just fill up the sink area uh, around the stock pot with hot water. And your milk will um, heat up by itself um, from the heat from the, the hot water. And when it gets to the right temperature, all you do is pull the plug out and drain it away. The milk will retain its heat and you won't have any problems. Now, if you don't want to try that, then the other option, there are 
Uh, and I've seen them online. There are double boilers of sorts that you can create, uh, whether they be electric ones. You can use roasting pans and uh, and just put water underneath those and uh, and boil them that way. But, you know, I'm, the, the double boiler method that I use, which is the small pot and the large pot on top with water in the smaller pot, I can regulate the heat quite well and uh, don't have any issues and the milk never gets burnt. So the last thing you want to do is put the milk directly on the stove. You will boil, burn the bottom of the milk and you don't want that. Even if you're stirring all the time, you're going to get some burnt bits on the bottom. Milk is just amazing when you put direct heat on it. It does burn readily. So that's why we use the double boiler method or you can use the sink method. Now, I hope that helps, uh, Julie. So uh, just persevere uh, and give that a go. Thanks for your question, by the way. Okay, the next question is from, this is from John. And John, uh, I believe he's an Aussie, but he lives in Thailand. So let's read this one out. It says, hi, Gavin, my daughter, brackets in Australia, has enthused me with her cheeses. So I'm going to give it a try. The only difficulty is I live in Thailand where they don't eat cheese. My daughter will send me some rennet. So some quick questions. Is there any problem using bought cheese i.e. blue Costello or a blue cheese or a good yogurt as a starter culture instead of a bought powdered culture. My background is in microbiology, so the logic works for me. So to answer your first question, John, yes, you can. You can get uh, the culture out of yogurt. Yogurt is a thermophilic culture, so it would be okay for Parmesan or uh, Gruyere or Emmental or whatever. Let me, oh, Romano. So those uh, thermophilic uh, culture are required in those cheeses. However, it is a specific culture for yogurt. So if you do use it as a starter culture, you will get a sour taste. It's a very high acidifier uh, in yogurt. As far as the moulds go, if you're going to extract moulds out of, say, a blue cheese, then you can do that, but then you haven't got the starter culture to uh, start turning the lactose into lactic acid. All you've got is the blue cheese mould. So look, it may pay to um, order some from Australia if you can. Um, I'm sure there must be some cheese making suppliers somewhere in Southeast Asia. You just have to use the Google machine to figure that out. Hopefully that helps out there. Uh, John goes on to ask another question, which is how is maturation likely to go in our temperatures here? With a lot of investment in a cool room, the coolest place I can get is about 24 degrees Celsius. Will it just speed up the maturation or is it just too hot? Summer is 34 plus Celsius and probably probably be too hot. Uh, won't need to heat the milk though. Uh, an answer to your question, I would make your cheese in winter in Thailand and you... We'll get away. 24 degrees Celsius, I've made cheese no problems at all. Um, if it drops down a little bit cooler at night, that's great for air drying the cheese. But just make sure that you've got a cheese fridge and uh, and that uh, you keep the temperature down at 13 degrees Celsius when you're maturing your semi-hard and hard cheeses. I would avoid making cheese in the summer unless you can make it in a cool room or a coolest place. You know, I've got the same issue here. Um, it's 34 degrees Celsius now, 34.4 degrees Celsius, and there's no way I would make cheese um, in this temperature. It just You wouldn't be able to heat the milk, but the problem is you wouldn't be able to air dry it either. Uh, you wouldn't, if you pressed it, it would, it would uh, not knit properly. So there's all sorts of weird and wonderful things that happen when you've got higher external temperatures. So, yeah, in winter, no problems at all, John. You can give that a go. Uh, and John's last question is, will have to use supermarket milk, no cows near here. If I use calcium enriched milk, will I need the calcium chloride? Well, yes, you will, John, because it's the pasteurization process and homogenization process that wreck the curds, um, wreck, that, wreck that milk for uh, curd, curd development. So even using a calcium enriched milk will not cut the mustard. You'll have to pop in some calcium chloride, and look, it's harmless stuff. It's used in commercial cheese making all the time. Um, I've used it forever and a day. No adverse effects. All it is is a liquid salt. It's no big deal, and it adds a bit of calcium into it as well. So hopefully that's answered all your questions, John, and uh, happy cheese making uh, once you get the rennet from your daughter. 
Now, the next one is more of a inf- informative question. Uh, well, I don't think there's any question in it, but anyway, we'll read it out. This is from Colin, and Colin's from New Zealand. Uh, he had a voicemail. Oh, sorry, not a voicemail. Oh, yes, he did. He had a voicemail last episode. So Colin says, hi, Gavin. Um, I started our communication with a few pictures of my home cheese making equipment and we'll move on to the setup that I use. Most of the bits like the pots I have procured from secondhand shops, etc. The temperature controllers for the cheese pot and fridges are available on eBay and Trade Me. Um, in New Zealand, they're about $40 each. And he's mounted them in a basic plastic box that you can get from electrical outlets. He's got an element in his um, cheese pot, and by cheese pot he's talking about his uh, how you heat up your your milk when you're making cheese. Now he's using a double boiler method. Now what I've got, I won't go any further into his into his email, but it's a pretty neat setup. He's sent me three photographs. Now I'm going to pop those into the show notes so everybody can have a look. If you're uh, listening from a uh, a device, um, a portable device then just pop over to uh, littlegreencheese.com and you'll be able to see the photos on the show notes there. Um, so uh, they are very interesting, uh, he's, the way he's got his double boiler set up. So very good. Thank you very much, Colin, for sending that information in. I will pop it into the show notes. Um, it is a great advice for home cheese makers. If you want a, a system where you can kind of set and forget you know, at each stage if you need to up the temperature then you can do it with uh, the device that Collins um, invented here. So very ingenious little uh, piece of equipment that he's got for cheese making. Well, that's about all I've got time for this week. Thanks, everybody, for listening. For upcoming workshop dates, if you're in the Melbourne area, go to littlegreenworkshops.com.au Alternatively, you can find all of my recipes over in my ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home. That's available in all ebook formats and is available for download all over the world. You can also find my cheese making video tutorials within the ebook or on my YouTube channel. Just search in YouTube for Greening of Gavin or Gavin Weber and you'll find those cheese making videos. There's also a link off of the littlegreencheese.com. You can find them there. Well, thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Little Green Cheese podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop, News Theme, and Call to the Dairy Cows.